1899, Nikola Tesla received a mysterious message from space. He was listening to lightning discharges using an ultra-sensitive antenna, when suddenly, amidst background crackling, he heard a distinct tapping. And those three thuds were repeated over and over again. Astonished, Tesla realized there was no way such a thunderstorm could produce such orderly signals. However, there was no radio communication on Earth at that time, and Tesla concluded that that night he heard signals from Mars created by intelligent creatures. With his submission, newspapers vied in speculating about the prospect of interplanetary contact. Of course, most scientists made fun of Tesla's conclusions. But when we received this incredible space signal, nobody laughed anymore. But that's not all. In the spring of 2022, NASA received mysterious signals from our own Voyager 1 space probe. What's going on? Is space really trying to talk to us? In this video, you'll find out. What signals did scientists have to hide from the public to avoid causing mass panic? How dangerous is it to send response messages to extraterrestrial civilizations? And will we be able to uncover the secrets of the most mysterious signals from space? Perhaps if we could cross the Voyager 1 with the telescope that detected the WOW signal, the resulting hybrid could shed light on strange messages from space. It's a shame science doesn't work according to the same principles as character creation in the fantasy role-playing game Bloodline Heroes of Lithus. Here, you can create and customize heroes through their system of marriage between different clans. Now, you can create over 800 different characters with unique talents, traits, and appearances as well as pass down the best qualities of the parents to their descendants in order to destroy enemy clans with maximum efficiency. And if you want to participate in the Halloween event, you'll be able to obtain the Accursed Champion from the new vampire clan of natural-born assassins for free. Hit the link in the description or scan the QR code on the screen to receive a gift of a special starter pack worth $20. And while you're creating your heroes in Bloodline, I'm going to tell you how heroes from the science clan decoded signals from space. Nikola Tesla was not the only one to receive strange radio transmissions from space in the early 20th century. In 1920, the inventor of radio, Guglielmo Marconi, talked about repeated signals which obviously came from beyond Earth. And engineer Thomas Edison stated that inhabitants of other planets are evidently trying to contact us. Only in the 50s and 60s, with the first space missions to explore the solar system, it became clear that there was not a single civilization in Earth's vicinity. But what did Tesla and Marconi hear then? Maybe this. When converting radio waves into audio, this is how the northern lights sound. Those clicks are the streams of charged particles from the sun hitting Earth's magnetic field. Today, scientists assume that the primitive equipment of Tesla and Marconi lost most of the faint peaks and only a few strong clicks remained. But there's also a more intriguing theory. That night, Tesla's ultra-sensitive antenna could have really received an alien transmission. But the source wasn't Mars, it was Jupiter's moon Io. It rotates inside the powerful magnetosphere of the gas giant and thus produces structured radio noise very similar to an artificial signal. Perhaps that's what Tesla and Marconi heard by a lucky coincidence. And as our receivers evolved, we began to receive increasingly mysterious signals from space. In 1964, physicists Robert Wilson and Arno Penzias worked on a microwave ultra-sensitive Holmdel horn antenna in New Jersey. They were tasked with finding the absolute background minimum to improve wireless communication. But no matter which way Wilson and Penzias directed their receiver, they heard the same thing instead of the expected silence. 
A deafening roar stunned the scientists' ears from literally anywhere. But they immediately realized that it was not a threatening message from a belligerent alien civilization, but something even more incredible at that time. The hum of the Big Bang itself. In billions of years, it's weakened and shifted to the microwave range. But it's still there. And it was Wilson and Penzias who discovered what we now call the cosmic microwave background. This was the first undeniable proof of the Big Bang Theory, for which both scientists received the Nobel Prize. But some signals from space were so strange that astronomers were in no hurry to report them to the public, fearing mass panic. In 1967, British scientists installed a giant and highly sensitive radio telescope called the Interplanetary Scintillation Array. It was initially designed to receive such signals from mysterious space objects. This is how quasars would sound in the audio spectrum. They're powerful, permanent sources of broadband radio noise in a variety of ranges of frequencies at once. Back then, scientists didn't know it was produced by matter falling into a supermassive black hole, but they didn't doubt its natural origin. After all, artificial signals that other civilizations could use for communication should be narrowband and non-permanent. And what a surprise it was to the British postgraduate student Jocelyn Bell Burnell when on August the 6th, 1966, the Interplanetary Scintillation Array received this. Those were narrowband, intermittent signals at a frequency of about 110 megahertz, which repeated every second in a bit. They came from the Little Fox constellation, but the astronomers didn't see anything there. This source was so similar to a beacon of extraterrestrial civilization that Bell and her colleagues have seriously nicknamed it LGM-1, which stands for Little Green Men 1. The astronomers decided to keep the discovery a secret to avoid frightening the public, and soon they found several more similar LGMs. Such a radio beat was produced by dozens of invisible sources at various distances from Earth, and Jocelyn Bell realized she had found not artificial radio beacons, but absolutely natural ones. These are pulsars, very compact and usually invisible neutron stars. As they rotate, they rhythmically bathe Earth with powerful streams of intermittent radio waves in a narrow range. And astronomers realize that a real extraterrestrial civilization is unlikely to use frequencies already occupied by pulsars and quasars. Thus, the members of SETI, which stands for Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, identified a small number of channels where the universe is almost silent, and therefore, it's where we should look for messages from aliens. Scientists concluded that if they wanted to contact Earth, they would send a powerful, narrowband transmission at one of the most convenient frequencies. And ten years after discovering pulsars, we received exactly such a signal. This mysterious message from deep space forever changed our expectations of contact with the aliens. It was this mystical sound that inspired the scientist Carl Sagan to write his contact novel that was later turned into a popular movie. In that movie, a radio astronomer, played by Jodie Foster, suddenly hears a similar alien transmission on the radio and raises the observatory staff to better align the antennas and not lose the transmission. However, in the case of a real mysterious signal detection, that isn't how it happened at all. Since the early 60s, the Big Ear Radio Telescope in Ohio State University has continuously scanned the sky as part of the SETI initiative, and all its observations were carried out through this old computer, IBM 1130. Its printer used to print out kilometers of digital radio signals, 
and it was genuinely impossible to handle that amount of work in the office. Astronomers would take those tapes home, and most of the time, endless ones and twos would appear before their tired eyes. Just typical space radio noise. But when the astronomer Jerry Emmon flipped through the printouts for August the 15th, 1977, a totally impossible sequence of symbols caught his eye. Those few digits and letters on the background of ones and twos stood for an incredibly powerful narrowband signal. Emmon was so shocked that he not only circled that area in red, but also made a handwritten WOW note. Since then, the famous WOW signal has haunted several generations of scientists and to this day remains the main candidate for artificial transmission of extraterrestrial origin. To begin with, it is on average 30 times more powerful than the noise level and it can be estimated even by a non-specialist using the synthesized signal-based audio recording. At first, you hear faint crackling, but then… It sounds like something suddenly makes a live broadcast of a loud concert on a strange musical instrument. At the same time, the WOW Signal's solo party lasted for 72 seconds, which eliminates the possibility of transmission from any spy satellite. After all, any object in near-Earth orbit would flash over the big ear in just a few seconds. Moreover, the WOW Signal has a special frequency, about 1420 megahertz. From the very beginning, scientists from the SETI initiative considered it to be one of the main frequencies for potential interstellar communication. But above all, on this very frequency, the nucleus of the excited hydrogen atom emits radio waves. I mean, it's kind of a wink to our kind, like, dudes, we know quantum physics too. And on Earth, radio transmissions at a frequency of 1420 megahertz are completely prohibited specifically so that scientists don't miss the signal from an advanced extraterrestrial civilization. So where could it be? Because of the Big Ear's specific design, the answer seems rather strange. The source of the WOW signal is somewhere in one of these two regions of space in the constellation Sagittarius. They seem very small, but in fact each of them contains thousands of stars at various distances from Earth. Retransmission would help to determine the coordinates, but for almost half a century since that August day in 1977, scientists have never detected the WOW signal again. Even when the most sensitive radio telescopes of the New Mexican Very Large Array, filmed in the Contact movie, were pointed at those parts of the sky, the answer was complete silence. As a result, the discoverer of the WOW signal, Jerry Emmon, blurted out in anger during an interview in 1994. We should have seen it again when we looked for it 50 times. Something suggests it was an Earth source signal that simply got reflected off a piece of space debris. And in 2017, astronomer Antonio Paris concluded that this debris could be two comets from the solar system surrounded by hydrogen clouds. However, this version doesn't explain either the extraordinary strength of the WOW signal or its frequency at which no Earth transmitter can operate. Eventually, scientists rejected Paris' conclusions and Emmon took back his words spoken in a moment of desperation. And in 2020, amateur astronomer Alberto Caballero announced a possible breakthrough. He studied several dozen newly discovered stars in a potential WOW signal area and identified a sun-like star 1,800 light-years away from Earth as a possible source. It's almost our Sun's twin, but no exoplanets have been found near it yet. They may exist, but they're just invisible to terrestrial telescopes. But even assuming that the inhabitants of this system tried to communicate with us, such a distance, they should have used a radio transmitter orders of magnitude more powerful than any other terrestrial transmitter. And if they could spend so much energy on the WOW signal, they would definitely repeat it at least a couple of times. Nay, 
if they put all their resources into a single signal and at the same time encrypted the answer to the main question of life, the universe and everything in its amplitude changes, then we picked up that signal using a telescope that's just unable to discern such nuances. Oops, Earthers are so unlucky and the aliens are so dumb, like there was no other encryption method. If we want to send a signal to other civilizations, we'll do it right, won't we? The authors of the very first message of mankind to space are Soviet scientists. In 1962, with the help of Yevpatoria Planetary Radar, they sent this interstellar radio transmission. Well, they avoided the mistake of the possible WOW signal authors because they used an interrupt instead of amplitude changes for encoding. It was the ordinary Morse code that encodes the letters of Earth's alphabet. But to understand the message of the Soviet scientists, you need to have such a table at hand. Let's assume the aliens oh. have it. In this case, their ears will catch the name Lenin and the abbreviation USSR. That didn't age well. However, the message was intended not for some inhabitants of distant stars thousands of light years away, but for our closest neighbors on Venus. Cause back then, scientists didn't know it was a lifeless infernal oven. Luckily, the next space radio transmission from Earth was more reasonable and thought out. That's what American scientists sent from the Arecibo Radio Observatory in November 1974. This is an audio representation of the first out of 1,679 binary signals prudently encoded by frequency fluctuations rather than amplitude ones. An astronomer from another planet will experience even greater ecstasy than Jerry Emmon with his WOW signal. That's because they'll face an intriguing puzzle. The authors of the Arecibo message expect that the recipient will know to expand the bitmap into the picture of 73 by 23 pixels, and they'll get… um… a broken monitor. Then a scientist from another planet has to guess the horizontal representation with 23 lines, but a vertical one with 23 columns. This uh. is getting interesting. But will an alien understand what's encoded here? Let me try it first. This upper part here resembles clouds in the sky with a purple sun. And here it looks like a big tree, under which Stewie from the Family Guy series jumps on a children's trampoline in his signature red overalls. And if you think this decoding is too stupid and far-fetched, let's take a look at the real meaning of the signal. The beginning is quite understandable for any primary school student. Clouds are, in fact, numbers from 1 to 10. But then scientists decided to skip right to college and depict the chemical elements that make up the DNA molecule. That's the purple sun. And the tree crown turned out to be the nucleotides that make up DNA, illustrated with its famous spiral just below. It's not Stewie's head. And since we've suddenly switched back from complex chemistry to pixel art, why not, out of context, depict a little red person with not a trampoline, but the Arecibo telescope dish below? Oh yeah, there's also a pixelated model of the solar system awkwardly squeezed between them. Okay, are we absolutely sure that the extraterrestrial recipients from the Messier 13 cluster, situated about 22,000 light years away, will manage to decode this agglomeration of images from the Arecibo message? In fact, we don't even know whether they'll receive it, even if they carefully listen to the night sky. Because the Arecibo signal wasn't sent at that hydrogen frequency of 1420 megahertz preferred for interstellar communication. The signal was sent at a frequency of 2380 megahertz, which doesn't correspond to anything at all. It's just that Arecibo's transmitter happened to operate on it. And since it's not very powerful, the radio signal will probably dissipate long before the arrival at its destination. And to make sure the aliens don't get a chance to receive it, we only sent the message once without repeating it. As far as I can see, we're learning from narrow-minded WOW signal authors. 
However, by the end of the 20th century, SETI scientists had somewhat improved and sent two much more thoughtful radio messages in 1999 and 2003. These messages to several nearby star systems contain encoded mathematical formulas, chemicals necessary for life and other information about Earth. But it wasn't also without nudes, which we had already included in the golden plaques placed aboard the Pioneer spacecraft. We just need to ensure that the aliens don't sue us in the galactic court for harassment. Well, at least in 2018, the Sonar Music Festival organizers somewhat smoothed the impression of our nonsense by sending 33 specially composed electronic tracks to the Earth-like exoplanet Leuton B. But some scientists believe that we're taking an incredible risk by sending any kind of message into space. The extraterrestrial mind may not guess who Lenin is or what the little pixel person in the Arecibo message is meant to indicate. But the transmission parameters will surely make the extraterrestrial mind understand that it hears an artificial signal from another technogenic civilization. And if the aliens decode information from our most detailed and thoughtful messages, uh. then we just gifted the coordinates of Earth to some unknown creatures. What if the answer turns out to be not, hi, we received everything, but a planetary laser attack? Indeed, these aliens can regard the existence of another advanced civilization not as an incentive to start communication, but as an existential challenge. Should we reveal our presence in the galaxy? The only consolation is that against the rich Milky Way background, all our radio noise looks like this. Yep, a microscopic blue dot with a diameter of 200 light years. So even in the worst case scenario, killer lasers will incinerate Earth only thousands or even millions of years later. But it took just that long for the weirdest and most inexplicable radio signals from space to reach Earth. We started detecting these mysterious transmissions quite recently. On September the 30th, 2002, the Very Large Array in New Mexico received a series of unusual pulses. At first glance, it was very similar to what Nikola Tesla had received a century earlier. Except here, each peak lasted about 10 minutes, and the whole sequence took 7 hours. Those were basically five series of narrowband radio roar at a frequency of 330 megahertz. They hit Earth from a region of space near the center of the Milky Way at a distance of 300 to 24,000 light years. This variation is due to the fact that astronomers found absolutely nothing in the area of the supposed source of the roar. The mysterious signal was repeated twice, in 2002 and in 2003. Since then, it seems to have disappeared forever. What was it? In their scientific works, astronomers named this and several other similar signals galactic center radio transients and unofficially nicknamed them cosmic burpers. But this is more of a nervous joke, because scientists have no idea who or what produced those signals. They're kind of similar to the familiar pulsars, but on the other hand, pulsars work continuously with clockwork precision and don't burst into a loud roar once a year to fall silent later. But before astronomers could come up with plausible theories about GCRT, they were confronted with an even more fascinating and ancient mystery. These strange narrowband signals were first discovered in the old data from the Australian Parks Radio Telescope in 2007, and they're really easy to miss because these beeps last from a fraction of a millisecond to three seconds, and most often, they don't ever repeat. That's why such signals were called fast radio bursts, and some of them come close to the cherished hydrogen frequency of the WOW signal. All these be scattered fragments of messages from extraterrestrial civilizations, but if you put the sources of fast radio bursts on the starry sky, you'll see a flurry of spam coming from everywhere in the sky at once. 
is as if we're getting pinged by hundreds of different civilizations, millions of light years from Earth and one another. That sounds totally implausible. Fortunately, in 2012, one of the radio bursts was repeated for the first time ever and allowed scientists to narrow down the search for sources. These signals came to us from a dwarf galaxy 3 billion light years away from Earth. This means whatever it produced spent an enormous amount of energy on each millisecond radio burst. That amount of energy can be comparable to the Sun's activity over a few months. Typically, only supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies are capable of such costly tricks. But we've already heard the quasars. They make noise all the time and quite differently. What if at least some of the radio bursts are echoes of other civilizations' Dyson spheres? These megastructures around stars are the ones that could theoretically handle such high energies. However, seeing Dyson spheres at a distance of millions of light years is impossible. But on April the 27th, 2020, the Canadian Chime Radio Telescope finally detected the first fast radio burst from within our galaxy from a distance of only 30,000 light years. And by happy coincidence, several NASA X-ray observatories were watching its source at the same time. All this data clearly indicated that the fast radio burst was produced by a rare type of neutron star, a magnetar. Unlike a pulsar, this object has a magnetic field of incredible power, but most of the time it maintains complete radio silence. So why has it suddenly started talking? Scientists suggest that a magnetar's X-ray outbursts and radio emissions could be caused by an asteroid collision or an exotic star quake, but they can't say anything for sure. This means even the collapse of the Dyson Sphere right on the magnetar could be a pretty plausible version. However, scientists don't really like to seriously talk about aliens, especially since the time they burn their fingers with this topic in the most frustrating way. That same Australian Parks Observatory detected almost 50 high-frequency space signals from 1998 to 2015. They resembled fast radio bursts, but they changed their characteristics quite unnaturally. And therefore, they were very similar to artificial radio transmissions. And so they proved to be. You've just heard a signal produced by the technology of an advanced civilization. And that technology is a microwave in the dining room of one of the park's observatory's buildings. It took scientists 17 years to figure it out. And since then, such signals have been referred to as peritons. In addition to microwaves, they can be produced by lightning, aircraft radars, and other local sources that bounce off Earth's ionosphere and go directly into radio telescopes. But even after the scandal with the peritons, the search for space radio wasn't called off. And in October 2020, the Parks Observatory staff found something really intriguing in the previous year's data. It was a multi-hour narrowband signal coming from our nearest stellar neighbor, the red dwarf Proxima Centauri. Its frequency of 980 megahertz didn't correspond to any Earth-based sources, and at the same time, it's considered one of the potential frequencies for SETI. Moreover, judging by the shift in the chart, the signal kept moving away. Indeed, there is an Earth-like planet revolving around Proxima Centauri. During its orbit, this planet comes close to Earth and then far away from it. The mysterious signal was called Breakthrough Listen 1, and it looked so promising that the press immediately dubbed it the new WOW signal. But not for long. It turned out that other radio telescopes picked up several very similar signals, but from entirely different directions, not just from Proxima Centauri. It means that in 2020, the Parks Observatory received very distorted and repeatedly reflected radio interference from some near-Earth source. But even though scientists were proved wrong again, such discoveries give them invaluable experience. They'll help eliminate microwaves and other curiosities when we finally detect something really worthwhile. 
Perhaps such a revolutionary discovery is just around the corner. On May the 18th, 2022, NASA engineers received another signal from the Voyager 1 spacecraft, which left the solar system's outer limits 10 years ago. But here's the thing. The message received from the probe turned out to be utter nonsense. It's like the onboard computer accidentally generated it or just crashed. Meanwhile, NASA still has no idea what the problem is, but the agency seems to have forgotten that aboard Voyager 1, there is a golden record with a message to other civilizations. What if the aliens have already opened the probe and are trying to decode our message? Then, a strange radio signal from Voyager 1 may well be their clarifying question on a most unexpected topic.